This season we've got two big regulation changes. The first one, which we've known for some time, is the engine change. Um, we've gone from the normally aspirated 18,000 RPM V8s to a turbocharged 1.6 litre V6 um, with a much higher electrical content, so curves in, in layman's terms, and a very strict fuel consumption. Uh, so not, not only have a 100 kilos maximum fuel for the race, but we also have a maximum consumption or flow rate, if you like. Um, the old engines for reference we're using around 160 kilos, so it's a, a big reduction in fuel. And that, of course, means that there'll be a lot of strategy in the race. Most of the races we anticipate will be fuel capacity limited. So we'll have to save fuel through the race, which will mean different driving styles, um, compromising lap time at times to save fuel, which obviously means how you then use your remaining fuel. Do you, do you go out? quick at the start, try and break away and then save fuel? Do you save fuel early in the race and try and sprint later in the race? All those sorts of things um, will come into play. So I think it's a big technical challenge. Um, they're hugely complicated engines compared to the V8s to install, where the V8s were sort of a, a very well-known package. These engines, um, the engine itself is easy enough to install, but then of course you've got the turbocharger, the intercoolers, um, the electrical side in terms of the motor generator units, where the batteries, much bigger batteries. Um, bigger batteries mean bigger conditioning boxes for the batteries. It also means more cooling for those batteries, so that means more radiators on top. So roughly speaking, the radiator area on the car has doubled compared to a V8. Um, and that, of course, is another challenge, how you, how you cool the car with such a big heat rejection requirement. So it really is a, a big change for us. Um, the biggest engine change, without doubt, that we've had since the turbos disappeared in the late 80s. Um, arguably much bigger because of all the electrical side of it. So we've got that to cope with. Um, obviously, Renault, our partner, are the big players there in terms of the package itself. Our job is to install this in the, the neatest and most performant way we can. Um, and on top of that, the second big change is really revolve around the aerodynamics. What sounds are quite a small change, which is a, a 75 millimetres, that's roughly three inches, reduction in um, the width of the wing on each side. And that was done to reduce the chances of a wing being knocked off um, when two cars touch in a, a sort of um, dogfight, if you like. Um, but it has a big aerodynamic effect. Before the, the front wing end plate, allowed us to put the flow off the tip of the wing outside of the front wheel. Now the front end plate's right in front of the front wheel. It's in about the worst possible place. It's not inside, it's not outside. And that means that the majority of the flow now stagnates in front of the front wheel. A little bit of it finds its way outside, the rest comes inside. And in doing so, makes quite a mess. The front wheel wake effectively, or the combination front wing and front wheel wake becomes much bigger. And that causes all sorts of problems downstream as you approach the side pod and the diffuser. On top of that we have a, a lowered nose which I think is um, supposedly be done on the grounds of safety. It's, it's meant to reduce the chances of a car being launched if one car hits another in the manner that for instance when um, Mark Webber went up the back of Cove Line in Valencia a few years ago whether it may really makes a difference or not, I think is a, a much more moot point because it's been deemed that it's safer. So that's what we've had to go for. It's a funny regulation. Basically, what the regulation does is call for a maximum side view height. So it defines the, the top edge and side view. And then on top of that, there's a area 50 millimeters behind the front of the nose, um, which we have to meet in that area is quite low down, much lower than the side view. So what you end up, of course, with is almost two noses, one which is the main bulk of the nose, which is um, to this minimum side view height, and then almost a, a bulb sticking out from that to satisfy the, the area rule much lower down. So I think to varying degrees, I would imagine everybody's going to have these rather ugly and ungainly noses, which I think is a, an awful shame. The, 
to me aesthetics of a Formula One car is important. It, the car should look good and I think um, not many of the owners of these noses could, could really love them. Regulation changes which involve um, aerodynamic changes and therefore how you deal with those aerodynamic changes and how you try to make sure that the mechanical package and the tyres work in harmony with those aerodynamic changes is always a challenge. Um, so I think the, the rule changes we've had on the aerodynamics certainly present new challenges, there's no doubt about that. Um, some trepidation of course, we had, a, we had a competitive car at the end of last season um, with these big changes that all is history and it's, it's going to be a challenge of who comes up with the best solutions for these new regulations. Last season was a, um, whilst it appeared very easy in terms of the number of wins and the number of points we had at the end of the year, um, the sort of critical area around August last year then it was a very tight battle. Um, Mercedes seemed to be having good impetus. Ferrari and Fernando had had a very good start to the season and they certainly couldn't be ignored. So we were feeling far from comfortable as it was going to be an easy ride through the rest of the year to the championship. So we put a lot of effort into the development of RB9, last year's car, um, through June, July, August, September. Inevitably that brings with it the compromises that we of course have limited resources and while we're developing RB9 then that meant that work wasn't going into the new car RB10 which given the magnitude of the regulation changes that we've had over the winter was without doubt a, a compromise compared to what we'd have ideally liked to do but we, we felt that we needed to do that to try and win the championship we were in and then handle the, um, if you like, the pressures of time scales that resulted from that decision. Um, so I think time really has been our, our biggest battle, that we haven't had the time to do as much research as we'd have ideally liked um, on the background of the car before we had to commit to the, to the fundamental hardware of monocoque and gearbox case. The regulation changes in qualifying will probably be less of an effect in terms of things like strategy because the fuel consumption will be limited. Um, the total fuel used is irrelevant for qualifying. And then the, the electrical uses, if you like, the CURS usage is, is simply using programmes to optimise. So I don't think the regulation changes in terms of the engine will have a, a big effect from a strategy point of view. It may well be that some engines perform better in terms of their qualifying because fuel consumption is less of an issue than it is in the race. Equally, obviously there's all the other factors that of course come into play like tyre usage, so we might very well have a similar case to last year where some cars are easy on their tyres and perhaps then struggle to warm them up and get them to work properly in qualifying, but have a, a very good race pace and vice versa. I think early races um, could see quite a few upsets in the order. Reliability is the most obvious concern. The, the cars, the engine and power unit is, is tremendously complicated. Um, and whilst a road car manufacturer, it could be argued there are, there are some quite complicated hybrid cars out on the marketplace. Those cars have had the luxury of years of development before they, they come to market. We've got um, three tests, so 12 days or whatever that is, and, and then we're off to the first race. So it's a, it's a very compressed development schedule um, with something so complicated that is going to bring a lot of pressures and a lot of problems and probably quite a few breakdowns. So I think reliability will be a big issue at the start of the season. 
Equally, everybody finding their feet in terms of how to use the engines, um, how to best cope with the total fuel limit, how to um, cope with the aerodynamic changes that we've had, how to get all that to work with the, the new tyres. The tyres have been made harder over the winter to, to cope with the extra torque of the new engines. So all those things, I think, um, make for quite an unpredictable melting pot in the early races. I think Daniel's um, through the junior formulas and then the last two years at, at STR has um, shown a very good pace. He's a naturally fast driver. Um, we listened to his feedback when he, he drove our car at the Silverstone tyre test last season um, and gave good feedback. So that's all very positive. Obviously, now it's a matter of team and driver work, getting to know each other. Um, working together and and seeing how he gets on, how his, how his feedback is. Um, hopefully it will complement Sebastian's just as Mark's did last year or previous seasons. So it's a, it's a, a slight journey into the unknown because although he's a, been a member of the Red Bull family for some years, he's been in a, a different team so we ha don't know him as intimately as uh, when he's one of our own drivers. So um, hopefully it will be all good, looking forward to it. Have I enjoyed our designing the RB10? Yes, I have. It's, um, it's been a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, long hours for everybody in the factory. It was a very compressed design schedule because of the fact that we'd chosen to continue to develop RB9 in our championship battle quite late into the season. That really put the pressure on for all of us to to um, hit the deadlines um, but the pressure can be a good thing it, it can be stimulating um, it doesn't always seem so when you're kind of <laughs> leaving the factory at some antisocial hour in the evening and uh, gulping down a, a quick supper before going to bed but um, sometimes um, creativity comes out of those those high pressure environments so um, we shall see. It's certainly been a busy winter and now it's uh, that time of trepidation where we wait to see does our car perform as our simulation tools suggest it does or are there some nasty shocks that we haven't properly understood. What's everybody else been up to over the winter? Um, when you have a big regulation change like this then of course we all individually as teams go away and do our bit and, and do the best job we can. but. We've got absolutely no idea where that leaves us relative to our competitors. So, um, as I say, it'll be a, a slightly nervous time seeing where we are in the, in the um, upcoming tests. Obviously, the first win in China was very special. Um, we'd had a, the big regulation change over the previous winter, which uh, we had managed to read quite well and so we're suddenly in the unusual position where ourselves and Braun who hadn't been um, regular front runners previously were, were now the regular front runners so to, to win a race the first race is always a special moment to win the championship both championships um, the following year I think was also magical it, probably in many ways, particularly the drivers, the constructors was looking reasonable. So when we won the constructors in Brazil, the penultimate race, that was a great feeling. Um, but I think because one week later we had the, the drivers still to settle, then it didn't really sink in and we didn't really appreciate that success because the job wasn't finished. Um, when we managed the double at the end, then that was that was um, an amazing feeling to have done that after so short a time um, to have beaten the world's best. I think uh, that that will always go down. And then after that, really to stay at the top over, over the coming three seasons um, to show that we weren't a kind of a one-year flash in the pan.